It was only at the end of the consulate that he made up his mind to wear his hair quite short at the neck. And we may suppose that the reason must have been the very early baldness, which is already foreshadowed in Gerard's fine portrait of 1803. In Italy, he wore his hair quite long, flowing over his temples, a few locks only tied up into a pigtail with a ribbon. The whole of his head was, at that time, slightly powdered. On coming back from Italy, he gave up powder at Josephine's request, but he kept his hair long during the passage from Toulon to Alexandria. At Cairo, possibly, even at the Battle of the Pyramids, his hair was shorter. The hair in the temples had disappeared. All that light and floating veil which surrounded his face, and except at the back, his hair is cut pretty close, but not so much as might be fancied witness. A series of busts executed on his return to France from nature, which still show some long locks falling over the forehead, covering three quarters of the ears and encroaching considerably on the collar. At the same time, the first consul allowed his whiskers to grow as far as a third of the cheeks, which went down lower than the lobe of the ear and appeared to be pretty thick. These whiskers disappeared at the same time the hair became shorter at the back, but it was only quite at the end of the consulate that Bonaparte became le tendu, the shorn, as the soldiers called him. Gradually from that time, the forehead became bare, so much so that in some of the unflattered sketches at the end of the empire, we see that he brings the hair forward and that the long lock, which gives so lively a character to his face, comes from a distance. Having attended to his nails, Napoleon took off his flannel jacket and has some eau de cologne poured on his head and with a stiff brush himself brushed his chest and arms. The valet de chambre afterwards scrubbed his back and shoulders with the brush and then applied friction to the whole of his body, pouring on it vials full of eau de cologne. This habit of rubbing which Napoleon had, as he said, brought from the East and in which he partly attributed his health seemed to him most important. They were not allowed to do it gently. Harder, said he to the valet de chambre. Harder, as though you were rubbing an ass. Like the bath, the rubbing, and the brush were calculated, in his case, to keep the skin in such a condition as to always be able to perform its functions. In his case, said one of his physicians, as soon as the tissue of the skin became thickened by any cause, the commencement of irritation with more or less serious results showed itself, and the cough and other symptoms declared themselves violently. These symptoms yielded to the reestablishment of the action on the skin, the violent perspirations, which he brought on partly by baths of great duration partly by means of great excess of covering on his bed wore until it was scarcely bearable partly by rides on horseback of 60 kilometers and the same object after great fatigues he condemned himself always with the same object to 24 hours of absolute rest. Lastly, his temperament manifested a very singular peculiarity recurring periodically, which had an ascertained influence on his health, the cessation of which St. Helena coincided with the aggravated state of his unhealth. I shall be cured if I perspire, and if the wounds which I have on my thigh reopen, said he on January 22nd, 1821, three months before his death, but nature no longer answered the promptings of his will. Having been thus bathed, washed, and rubbed, the emperor dressed himself. He put on his flannel waistcoat, over which, after 1808, he wore in campaign, suspended by a black cord, a little heart of black satin of the size of large hazelnut under the silken envelope was an other envelope of skin in which was enclosed poison prepared according to the formula which was given to Cabernet to Condorcet and which appeared to be fallible. Later in 1812, the emperor substituted for this poison another prepared by Yvonne according to a different formula. And this poison played him false in 1814, but at the time of his departure for Spain, he took precautions so as not to fall alive into the hands of the enemies of France. And in 1815, after Waterloo, although in possession of a means of death, the effect of which he knew and which he carried about constantly in his person in a bag formed in his braces, he 
did not choose to make use of it. It was because he thought it well that his destiny should be fulfilled and that he might furnish with this prodigious example of human vicissitudes the sole revenge which his martyrdom and death could procure for conquered France against victorious England. And then came the shirt. Afterwards, Constant put on his feet very light merino socks over which he drew stockings of white silk kept up by elastic garters. He handed to him a pair of drawers, very fine linen or twill cotton, and a pair of knee breeches of white cursimere fastened at the knee with a small gold buckle. At times when, instead of shoes with gold buckles, Napoleon was going to put on soft riding boots, he wore very tight pantaloons of white cursimere or of knitted cotton. The knee breeches or pantaloons were held out with elastic braces. It was Chevalier, his tailor, who supplied the flannel waistcoats, 40 francs each. His shirts came from the great linen drapers, Madame L'Olive de Beauvais and Carreau Neuve de Petit Jean was also supplied the stocks of black toilet, eight francs apiece. The silk stockings from panniers cost 18 francs a pair, but Napoleon complained of it. Why dear for me than for anyone else, said he. I don't understand that. Ought I to be robbed? His shoes as well as his boots were very easy, a centimeter longer than his foot, which measured exactly 26 centimeters, half a centimeter broader at the middle of the sole, which measured seven centimeters further. The shoes with gold buckles, which Shaq Rue Matra supplied, were lined with silk, and care was taken to have them worn into shape for three days by a young man of the wardrobe named Joseph Lindan, who had exactly the same foot as the emperor. The shoe cost generally 15 francs a pair sometimes, but very rarely, and no doubt a campaign, Napoleon appears to have worn clogs over his shoes for hunting. He always did when he rode on horseback. He put on over his silk stockings, riding boots with linings either of Morocco or of silk plush, which was seen every day of fresh dressing. He was thus able to change it for shoes without having to change the stockings. These boots, which cost 80 francs a pair, were fitted with little silver spurs, scarcely more than a centimeter in length, some of which were very much worn out. Napoleon had 12 pairs, and the valet de chambre knew on what occasion such or such a pair had been worn. Thus the spurs of the campaign of Dresden and of the campaign of France, which Napoleon offered the list causes, saying, Take them, mon cher. I used them at Chambeau Père.